Good morning and welcome to December. How is that even possible? Talk about a year going by quickly. We hear a lot of complaints about 2020 and we thought it would never end. But by the same token, in some senses, it seems to have just rushed by. So here we are in December 2020. And I am so glad that you are here uh, to experience this sacred special month with us at Blowing Rock Methodist Church. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious God, who came long ago in the birth of Jesus and who comes day by day in a thousand different ways, large and small, we pray that you will come again. Come to us in our lives, in our world, in our nation, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our homes, but come to us, especially today, in this service of worship, that having felt your nearness, we might open ourselves up in the world that you may be near to others through us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is such a joy to have you here. Uh, I say that week by week, and I mean that week by week. Uh, Blowing Rock Methodist Church is a wonderful, wonderful place. Historically, four months a year, uh, we're in business, uh, worshiping in the high country uh, every Sunday morning. And uh, this year, uh, we decided not to uh, stop at the end of September, but to continue coming to you uh, online with Sunday morning worship every week. So thank you for being part of that. And thank you for sharing the word about that. As always, I encourage you to do so wherever you are, whatever state or community you're in, start telling other people that we're here every week and that uh, the more of you who choose to be part of us, the better and stronger our faith community becomes. I'm so, so glad to have you here. And we began now uh, well, we continue now uh, in the season of Advent, having begun last Sunday morning with a look at the, the Gospel of Mark, who doesn't really have a birth story, uh, but who has a story about the beginning and the meaning of the ministry of Jesus. And so we, uh, we keep going now, uh, week by week in December, uh, looking at the other Gospel accounts of the birth narrative. We thank you for being here. Go on our website. Take a look at what's there. You will find updates about the almost completed Habitat project. Um, some updates will also be forthcoming about the work that you have done uh, supporting mission ministries in the high country, <clears throat> especially uh, places like um, Hospitality House and uh, Health, Hunger and Health Coalition and others that meet so many dramatic needs. Um, in this autumn, you gave a substantial amount of money to help those agencies keep on keeping on. And we're anticipating more by year's end. Uh, but I thank you for that, for doing what you do and being who you are. And I thank you for being here with us. One of our privileges as people of faith is a time for community prayer. Uh, not a time when I pray and you listen, but a time when we pray and God listens, when we place our needs, our lives in God's presence. <clears throat> so I ask you now to just center, uh, breathe, uh, and come into a moment of community prayer together. Mine will be the words, but ours will be the Spirit. Let us pray together. O oh, loving God, who has made us and called us your own, in this season of peace on earth, goodwill to all, our hearts yearn for both, for peace among nations and goodwill among people, for peace in our land and goodwill in our workplaces for peace in the soul and goodwill in the home, for a peace that passes understanding when our hearts are broken, and goodwill toward others who struggle and suffer, for peace that endures, and goodwill that does not come and go conditionally. And we also pray, O oh God, that we become not merely recipients of peace, but peacemakers as well. 
Let us do and say those things that calm angers and restore broken relationships and contribute to moral and reasonable compromise and de-escalate the toxic them-against-us mindset that is a malignant force in our current society. Let us listen with more than feigned interest. Let us respond with genuine compassion. Let us see Bethlehem's child in the faces and hearts of others. And let us strive, even if sacrificially, to practice the love which we too often embrace more as a religious principle than as a daily lifestyle. May the Messiah who will come make us more than the world would have us be, so that by his grace we may find peace on earth and offer goodwill to all. This we pray in Jesus' name, remembering how he taught us when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I mentioned during the announcements a few minutes ago uh, how much you have done uh, just recently and are going to be doing again prior to year's end for the helping agencies in the high country. I've heard from some of the directors just in the last few weeks, again, saying thank you to uh, Blowing Rock Methodist Church. Uh, thank you in a difficult time. Thank you in an urgent time for all the gifts that you share and all the love you provide and how they are able to pass it along, meeting human needs because of what you do. So thank you. Thank you on their behalf. Uh, thank you on behalf of the church uh, for being a part of the ministry of Jesus uh, to people created in God's own image who are having a hard, hard time just getting by for themselves and their families. Thank you for making a way when there doesn't seem to be a way. But you can keep on doing that. You can continue being a healer and a helper. Uh, right here on our church website, you go to the donate button. Uh, it will show you how uh, to offer your, your charitable gifts um, that we might pass them along to wonderful agencies that do so much good for so many people. So I thank you in advance uh, for what you are doing and, uh, and know uh, the tremendous difference it will make in the lives of so many.
Well, last week we took a look at uh, Gospel of Mark as we began our journey through Advent. And this morning, I want to think with you about some verses, just a few, from the first chapter of Matthew, verses 18 to 21, as Matthew begins to tell his birth story. <clears throat> and as is the case with each of the Gospels, his is a little different. He tells it in a little bit different way, and we'll take a look at the reason for that. Listen with me to these verses from the first chapter of Matthew. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her away shamefully, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall, important, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, in your word, may we hear our word from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew wrote his gospel primarily to Hebrew readers, which is why he included some things that were a little different from Luke, for example, the other primary birth narrative, and certainly vastly different from John or Mark. Uh, Matthew was a Jew writing to Jews about the arrival of the Jewish Messiah. And that's why he began his gospel with that long list of names of 42 generations, which we call the opening genealogy from the Gospel of Matthew. You remember how it went, and Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, and on and on and on and on until we finally reach, and Jesse was the father of David, the king, and David the father of Solomon, and then again on and on and on and on until we finally read, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Why did Matthew begin with that really long, and some people say really boring, list of 42 generations from Abraham to David to Jesus? Because every faithful Jew in that age, and remember that was his target audience, a Jew writing to Jews, every faithful Jew in that age was committed that the, the, the Messiah had to be a descendant of Abraham and David. Uh, without those connections, let that person walk on water, heal the sick, raise the dead, be raised himself. It wouldn't be enough for them to accept that he's the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Chosen One from God. The Messiah had to be a descendant of Abraham and David, no exceptions. Edward VII was, for one brief year, uh, the rather inglorious king of England. Uh, he disdained many of the customs associated with being king and offended traditionalists by wanting to toss the customs out altogether. There's strike one. Second, he denied royal protocol by proposing marriage to a twice-divorced American woman who had no connection with British aristocracy. Uh, as titular head of the Church of England, that was not allowed. And as head of state, that was enough to cause numerous members of parliament to threaten to resign if he went ahead with it. So there's strike two. Now, as if all that were not enough uh, in that day and age, especially in England, there were even strong suspicions that Edward and his new bride were Nazi sympathizers. Talk about a big strike three. So after one year, he resigned, and England breathed a collective sigh of relief. In truth, everyone knew there were countless people in England at that point in time who would have been far 
far more capable monarchs, including Baldwin and Churchill and a whole laundry list of others. But their abilities notwithstanding, it was the bloodline that mattered. Uh, Churchill, for example, was simply not uh, a descendant of ancient kings and queens. So whatever talents he may have possessed, and they were many, uh, the one thing he did not possess was the one requirement that was non-negotiable. Being king was ultimately an inherited virtue. Jesus may have had greater gifts and powers than anyone else who ever lived. As a matter of fact, you and I are firmly convinced that is true. But had he not been in the bloodline of Abraham and David, no faithful Hebrew would have proclaimed him as king. Uh, Joseph, Jesus' father, was in that bloodline, and that's why Matthew began his gospel with the genealogy, tracing Jesus back to David and to Abraham, because he knew that if he couldn't do that, no one would even read the other things that he had written. Now, there's a second point about Matthew's birth narrative. Some of you by now are thinking, hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Joseph was not Jesus' daddy. <laughs> not really. Mary was a virgin when she gave birth. <clears throat> so uh, it says, you know, Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, what difference does it make whether or not Joseph was a descendant of Abraham or David or anybody else? Here's why it matters. In that age in Jewish culture, and it was a patriarchal age, as you recall, the male who named the baby was considered the father. Didn't have to be the biological father. It could be the daddy. It could be the uncle, the granddaddy, the next door neighbor. It didn't really matter. Any male who chose the name for the baby was immediately considered the authentic parent. So, that's why Matthew had the angel instruct Joseph, not Mary, to name the baby. Mary shall conceive and bear a son, the angel said to Joseph, and you shall call his name Jesus. Remember in Luke's gospel, the angel says that to Mary. You shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. No, no, in Matthew, the angel talks to Joseph. Because once Joseph named the baby, he was immediately accepted by everyone as Jesus' dad. And therefore, also immediately, Jesus became a descendant of Abraham and David. Son of Abraham, they called him. O thou son of David, they proclaimed on Palm Sunday. And with those words, Matthew's readers were willing to accept Jesus as their Messiah, their King. So. What's our takeaway from all this? Let me mention three things, and I'll do it real quickly, I promise. First, Matthew's elevating Joseph's status reminds us that even those who are too often overlooked are still valuable contributors. Not only the jet pilot, but also the worker who secured the bolts that kept the wings in place. Not only the high school basketball coach, but also the custodian who kept the gym floor clean and polished. Not only the surgeon, but also the tech who made sure all the instruments were on the tray. Not only the sculptor, but also the quarrier who dug the stones are absolutely indispensable. By reminding us of the importance of Joseph, Matthew reminded us that everyone, even the too often overlooked or ignored, is vital and valued. That's first. Second, Matthew wrote in a specific way to a specific audience, reminding us that God speaks to us where we are. Uh, the journey of faith is kind of like riding a train. We don't all have to be in the same car. We are all simply moving in the same direction. We don't all have to know or understand the Bible's stories equally or to interpret theology similarly or uh, to grasp all things uniformly. 
God loves each of us as we are. And wherever we are, whatever car of the train we're on, God will find us there. You matter to God just as I am without one plea. Third, third, <laughs> like Luke, ultimately the story is all about Jesus. Uh, Luke emphasizes Mary's lineage, but in the end, it's about the birth of Jesus, not about his mom. Matthew emphasizes Joseph's lineage, but in the end, it's about the birth of Jesus, not about his dad. Probably John summed it up best of all for both Matthew and Luke when he wrote, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of truth and glory. It was about Jesus at Christmas and every other day as well. Did you know that the early Puritans refused to celebrate Christmas Day? <laughs> uh, even into the mid-1800s, in as progressive a city as Boston, children went to school on Christmas Day, and trees and lights and gifts and Santa Claus were not allowed. Why? Because they said, if we celebrate the birth of Christ only one day a year, we have missed its meaning. Instead, his birth should be celebrated every day throughout every year. Every day should be an observance of prayer and piety, worship and works, devotion and dedication to him. The Puritans contended that is what the Bible teaches, that in the final tally, Christmas is really all about Jesus all the time. That's why we hear so often the phrase, let's keep Christ in Christmas. Now, personally, I, I don't think we should give up any of the fun and festive things that we do in December. Uh, they continue to remind us of the arrival of Jesus and how earth-changing that was. Now, we keep doing those festive and fun things, but hopefully we remember why we do them. So, thanks, Matthew, for reminding us that Christmas is for everyone everywhere, wherever we are along the journey. But ultimately, Christmas is about Christ. Receive the benediction. May the God of Christmas send Jesus to you again this year so that your spirit may be enlivened and empowered by his own. Amen. And God will raise you up.